Hi, so this one is about improving partnerships and it's generally teamwork and debating. I think that a lot of debating will come down to how well you work with your partner and that a lot of individually skilled people or even two individually skilled people can be beaten by a team that works very well together. And I think there are three main things you probably want to consider that uh, to improve upon. The first is complementing each other in terms of strength and in terms of just knowledge. Uh, obviously, with different speaker roles, you will have very different you know, obligations and roles in the debate. But also knowing maybe different things, um, having different philosophies on debating can be very helpful in as much as they can maybe cause you to argue and disagree on things a lot more. Sometimes these arguments can produce uh, better uh, approaches and strategies and rounds. The second is coordination. I think a lot of debating is just about how well are you going to discuss things with one another, communicate things with one another, and be on the same page in essence. The last thing is just saving time. I think in prep, a very good team can save five minutes um, of 15 compared to a team that has very good individual speakers but has never worked together before. I think either saving time or just producing more in that same amount of time is very crucial in debates given 15 minutes isn't a lot um, but additionally, there is a very small difference between teams at a very high level. So I think there are obvious things that, I don't know, like n no matter where you are in debating, you kind of just understand these are important things to have as a team. So I'm going to get through them now. And if you're doing this already, then great. If not, then I think I, I hope that you are. So the first thing is you want to agree on, I think, three things. Number one is goals and just asking what do you want to achieve? And I think that's important because I feel like when people are on a different page, you're really setting yourself up to disappointment. Um, if, for example, one of you is just doing this for fun and the other one absolutely wants to win no matter what cost, there's a lot of resentment that might be created. There's a lot of disagreement with how to go about your time. And I think that goes hand in hand with commitment. Um, how much do you want to do this debating thing? because it gets tiring when maybe you're the only one that's training and your partner might not be. And I don't think that's something that should be expected of all speakers because you know people have lives outside of debating, people have you know different interests, hobbies, debating might not even be their main thing. And I don't think it should be expected for them to have that as their main thing. But I think it should be something that both people are on the same page on because it can get tiring. And even if it's not equal, I think as long as both people have a good understanding of this, I think it's fair. Especially given you have different things going on at a different time. Like maybe you're both very committed to debating, but one of you, I don't know, is at a very difficult academic stretch. One of you has a job that gets very stressful at a particular major's time. And so creating expectations for commitment to debating, I think is really important just to ensure that if you're the only one training, it should probably be okay with you if you've known that this was going to be the case before. Um, lastly is just roles. So what are you going to research on? Where do you speak? I think these are things that are very difficult to work out in a tournament. And obviously some flexibility is good. Um, I used to do a lot of speaker role switching in the middle of my career. Um, even in the middle of a tournament or even in the middle of a round, we would uh, swap and decide then. Um, but I think understanding why you're doing that rather than it just being a vibe thing, I think it is a much better way of approaching debates. I think there are some partnerships of very skilled people that don't work. And a lot of the time it's because they don't agree on the things above. And it's better to acknowledge that than to force it. Because a lot of, I think, uh, trials for different university debate societies will just try and pair the most skilled people with one another. And while I think that generally should work out, um, I've had the fortune of having teammates that I both work well with and I think are incredible people. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that you just have very different styles, uh, agreements. Maybe one of you will have to compromise a lot more than the other. And acknowledging that you don't want to do that will probably be better than trying to force two very good speakers who are not on the same page into one team. Next thing is just you want to be very um, organized. You want to settle into a routine. So prep time should have some things that are agreed upon, things that you know that you have to do during the round so that uh, it doesn't get messy. 
I feel like when things are vague, it's more likely to be prone to problem, more likely to be prone to maybe one person trying to, you know, like having a stronger personality than the other person, and therefore having more control over prep time when, I don't know, maybe the other person wants to have some silent time first. I think setting clear boundaries and expectations for this prep time, I think will ensure that, uh, I don't know, individual emotions right before a round or the nature of your personalities don't get in the way of what might actually be best for you. And I think that's worked very well for me and my partners because I think the structure we've had when we've gone through prep time has always been very accommodating of everyone getting their ideas out. And I've never personally felt like, you know, I was not able to do that with any of my teams. And a lot of that is they're very nice people, but I think a lot of it is also having the space and time that is designated to you in every round um, is very helpful. So the less obvious advice that I want to get on is I think the first thing you want to do is make plays. And what I mean by that is that in sports, sometimes you'll have hand signals or names for things such that once everyone on a team has heard this, they know exactly what they're going to do next. And I think having frames, strategies, and techniques that are useful for debating, but are also highly situational and require you to be very coordinated. Um, and I think executing them requires a lot of coordination. So given that, you want to ensure that both of you are on the same page and know what you have to do. Because sometimes there is limited time in a round and you have to spend so much time talking about no no this is the strategy here's what we should do here's what to do next here's how we should go about this rather than just if you have shorthand and you've seen this in a round you've done before you know that this is how you go about it so for example i've had rounds where opening just took absolutely everything we have uh taken and sometimes I'd tell my partner who would be whipping, i tell them, I'm gonna go a little rogue. I feel like this extension is still good and it's new. You just have to listen and weigh it out completely because I will not be able to do a lot of the weighing. And so when they know that I'm gonna go a little rogue, they know exactly what to do. They're going to stop uh, trying to defend everything we talked about in prep and instead listen to my member speech a lot and provide weighing mechanisms for that member speech rather than the agreed upon arguments in prep so that we still beat our opening team. These are things that if my partner did not know what that might entail would have been very difficult because they would have or they essentially are switching out so much of their old material for new material that I'm asking them to come up with on the spot. And it's a big ask but it was a necessary ask. At the same time though it's something that was only possible because we knew exactly what was going to happen. And so you want to be able to have these kinds of situational techniques and strategies, especially when the round is going to call for it. And if you have something like, for example, if I'm a member of Gov, and then DPM says the extension we had been planning for the entire round, you don't have much time. And you want to ensure that you are focusing on the new thing rather than focusing on things that you are trying to kind of stretch material out from because you agreed on it in prep. Having shorthand for this is really useful. And it puts you on the same page without spending too much time discussing, especially because this adaptation, again, requires you to spend all of your time coming up with new material rather than, again, like the things you've thought of in prep. It can be as simple as this is what we did in this round before in training or in a tournament before, but discussing this in preparation for a tournament helps a lot. Um, so if you can have, again, shorthand names for this, frames for this, um, it really helps. Next is you want to clearly identify prep time routines. I think prep should be both structured but still flexible. And what I like to do is have a default of timestamps where you agree on how prep time should work. But at the start of prep, you have to immediately identify how you should shift from the default. So for example, um, the general way I've approached teams I've had before is that the first speaker, regardless of who it is, will be spending more time listening to prep and contributing their own ideas, of course, but mostly at the start of prep. After that, everyone else is helping organize everything else. And so there will be times where, for example, the first speaker will have a much better grasp of the motion. Um, and it might be better for them to lead prep and at the same time come up with their speech, just because maybe it's a very niche amount of matter that they might know more on and you might want to leave it to them to come up with it. 
in these times then you want to immediately identify that you don't want to wait for it to happen so identifying how you might shift will be very helpful for example i like to have silent time uh, for prep but there will be some rounds where you know exactly what the argument is and you feel like getting to work is more important uh, and so you say let's ditch silent time we know what we have to argue let's just do it and make it a very concise speech very compelling speech I think especially in 3v3 like Australs, Asians for example that's a lot of people and you don't need everyone doing the same thing I think you want to ensure that people are doing different things for the team especially ones that might not already or aren't currently being considered so for example um, and I think first speaker is probably least flexible with this just because you have to speak first and so thinking about things that aren't related to the first speaker speech is a bit difficult but I think for example um, I've had I normally speak deputy but I've had my whips help me come up with extensions and leave the thinking of an extension to them whereas maybe I'm more on the case or vice versa I could be um, more on extension and they could be more on trying to build the first speaker case so things like this um, and you want to ensure all your bases are covered I tend to think about how to rebut the strongest arguments from the other side um, when I know that my whip is going to be focusing on how to possibly build the case so you want to be doing different things I think everyone trying to do the same thing not always strategic you want to make sure everyone is aware of what's happening and that you don't have someone that just has no idea what the case is going to be but I think spending all of your mental energy on just doing one thing might not be the most effective or helpful thing. You also want to coordinate in-round logistics. And honestly, I think people underrate how important in-round logistics can be. A lot of debate rounds can come down to really small things. Like maybe you didn't write something, you didn't hear something, or you didn't say one thing and it was on your paper, things like that. Some speakers will be busier than others at different times. So for example, when I speak member, I'm listening very intently to PM or LO, but I'm kind of chill after my MG speech, for example. I can listen to MO, not do too much, op whip, not do too much. You want to stay engaged and you want to do what your partner needs most. So you want to communicate what you need from your partner. One thing I personally struggled with before is tracking because I'm thinking of a bunch of different rebuttals, but I'm not hearing what the other side is saying all the time. And so one thing I'd ask for my first speakers is, can you type down what they're saying or write down what they're saying, just so I know what I'd possibly have to rebut. I can think of the rebuttals, but it's hard for me to think of all the rebuttals and at the same time, listen to their speech. And so being able to do that helps a lot um, and ensuring that you are communicating that. You also wanna agree on your communication methods so my previous teams have been very particular about the format. You have to first write down the idea you are rebutting and then the rebuttal after. And we used to just type down sentences, type down ideas. That's very difficult because this like, stream of consciousness is very hard to sort through if you're in the middle of a debate round and making a speech, knowing what works best for you. Especially because I know that in-person tournaments have been very difficult in terms of sometimes someone will speak to you and they're gonna say something in your ear, but you're trying to listen to the speaker very hard to do both at the same time. It might be best to ask them to write it down in a little note and ensure that they can do that rather than you know disrupt your ability to listen to the other speaker. Next is you want to communicate adjustments. Especially if you're speaking first, it's crucial to communicate what adjustments might have to be made. So sometimes you don't prove an argument, um, not because you didn't mean to, maybe you ran out of time, maybe you overtimed on the first argument, undertimed on the second argument. Um, maybe you're missing a rebuttal or not engaging with a point and you need someone to engage with it or you're changing strategy maybe you're speaking member and you're going to do something very different from what you agreed on you have to make sure your whip is well aware of that because if you're not communicating that it might be difficult for them uh, to rebut or to come up with main met weighing methods this puts additional load on your partner to adjust um, because you're changing what you had agreed upon so ensure that if you have material um, to help the adjustment, I forget to complete the sentence, that you provide it. So for example, if you fail to prove an argument, but you have the reasons written down on paper or on a Google Doc, you tell them where it is, what they could possibly do, especially if you expect the next speaker to point it out that you didn't prove it. It also saves time for them because they can just read um, rather than having to think of new reasons on their own. You also have to know when to commit 
and want to diversify. Because there are times when commitment to a suboptimal strategy is better than partial commitments to many different strategies. Note that I'm saying here that it's sometimes, not all the time. I think there are times where having many different strategies and approaches in a round is a good thing. But especially when these optimal strategies are contradictory, when the optimal strategy will take a lot of time or material that you do not know um, to be able to reach this optimal strategy. Like for example, you know that you have to prove something and it's the best thing to do in a debate. You just have no idea how to do it. You should probably try um, as much as you can, but understanding that if you cannot do that, you might have to take a different approach, a different extension, for example, it might be better for you to commit to that suboptimal extension rather than trying to commit to the optimal one. Or you and your partner completely disagree on what the optimal strategy is. So you might have different philosophies of what's winning in this debate, how to win the debate. And in that instance, being uh, able to commit to something that you may not agree with might actually be better than you know, going different ways with you and your partner. So. A good example of this is when you have a risky extension that you need both the member and the whip to be all in on because maybe it takes a lot of proof. Maybe it's something that if rebutted could possibly be taken down well. And so you need the whip to be very hands-on with defending it from this rebuttal and rebutting the other side as well. Um, or you need to make it very believable and at the same time spend a lot of time weighing it. Maybe it's both difficult to believe and um, needs a lot of weighing, but if you can do both, it's going to work out well. So it's in these times where you need complete commitment from both speakers, especially if, for example, it's the last argument that you have at closing and you have nowhere else to go because opening took so much, but you know you could possibly beat off bench with it. Being able to understand this, I think, and knowing that you should commit to a suboptimal strategy in this instance, maybe you don't beat OG at CG, but you know you could beat OO and CO, you might need to have people all in. And identifying this is sometimes difficult. I think diversifying and going in different directions is good. And the way to assess that is, when you go in these many different directions, are they things that are fairly straightforward, won't take that much time, or are things that are just easy to prove and to believe? In those instances, you might wanna go the many different options route, just in case, right? But if that's not the case, like you have three arguments that are all very difficult to prove. It might be good to just focus on one, have both speakers go all in on it, defend it to death, and hopefully advance in an out round. So you have to be able to compromise sometimes as partners. Sometimes you will not fully believe your partner, but you have to give in and say, okay, I trust you, let's go all in on this. And that saved me in a lot of rounds where either my partner has been gracious enough to trust me, or I have been willing to trust my partner, even if I've just disagreed with them, knowing when to do these things is really, really important. Um, it's also really good to try each other's roles and have different partners. So specialization is important, and it, but it helps to know what position you're putting your partner in a lot of the time. So for example, I spoke a lot of depth later on in my career, but spoke a lot of first early on in my career. And when I was in that middle part, I became a much better first when I was understanding what it was like to dep, And knowing that my partner, uh, don't have consent to say the, say the name, but they were a very good partner. Um, they are, or rather, they were very good at coming up with a lot of material, rebutting everything, thinking quick on their feet. And what I started to understand was that when you're able to do that, sometimes what you just need is time. And buying more time for your partner at first is a really crucial thing. So for example, let's say we had three arguments and my partner could possibly take one, but I could possibly also just take all three and give them the full seven minutes to focus on the things they want to say after me. It was sometimes the more strategic thing to do. That's something I didn't realize until I started depping and realized that I don't need this additional argument. If my partner can say it, I actually need the additional two or three minutes that I would have spent on that argument to instead win the opening exchange. And so, Understanding what it's like to do the other speaker's role sometimes really helps in knowing what's difficult about it, how you can make their life easier and when you work together. It also really helps to speak with other people because I think when you specialize, it can also kind of become a crutch. And there's some skills that you overdevelop and um, 
others you underdevelop or you lose your sense for other skills. So when I was speaking a lot of first, I was very good at constructing, but I had not spent that much time rebutting because even when I spoke LO, my focus was just, let's just build as much as possible. I think when I was speaking deputy, it helped me understand a lot better how do I rebut and still remain very constructive? How do I incorporate rebuttal and responses into the argumentation I'm trying to sell? And given that, when I spoke LO again, I was much more effective at LO, but understanding how these rebuttals uh, could be incorporated and how to give them efficiently. And that's something that sometimes only happens when you work with other people that put you in many different positions. Uh, this is my last tip, and it's honestly just be friends. Like, sometimes the personal connection is all you have after a bad round, after debating, and if you're retired, it's nice to be friends with your partners. And obviously, this is just like a good human thing, good social thing. But even from the perspective of improvement and wanting to do well at debating, I think having a personal connection is very good for the rough moments. Sometimes you will underperform. Sometimes your partner will underperform. Sometimes both of you will underperform. And you need to find ways to know how are you going to do well in the next round um, if you know you just like drop one of the biggest losses, you know? Um, and knowing how to forget bad rounds and knowing how to move on from bad rounds, I think it's a lot easier when you can trust your partner. So it's helpful to find activities you can enjoy together and that you can do between rounds, for example. Uh, video games have been huge for me. In almost every major I've done, it's been playing video games, whether it was like Fall Guys or Smash, watching YouTube videos, things like that that are kind of fun, that lighten the mood after a loss or a bad performance, and then just make it a lot easier uh, to cope, especially because it makes it easier for you both. I understand that some people might want to be alone um, and might prefer you know, their own company, but it also really helps to have dynamics between teams so that it's easier for you to recover you know, together. And I think it's tempting to always have meetings, case builds, etc. But honestly, these can only matter so much, especially because when you have a rough round and you're thinking, how do I fix this? What do we do? How do we meet? It just adds stress to an already stressful situation. Um, and obviously, these are important things that I don't think are should be ditched. Um, but also knowing that they aren't the solution to everything and that debate isn't just like a logical game, but one where emotions, morale will play a very big part. I think it's important to know when to ditch these meetings, these trainings for something that's a bit more enjoyable for team building activities, etc. And the last thing is just uh, comfort is a huge part of debating. Uh, sometimes you find someone scary or you're not really friends. It's harder to tell them your ideas, especially if you're afraid of thinking, you know, they'll think you're stupid or it's not good or if you want to disagree with someone but not want to come off as you know like argumentative or confrontational these are things that when you're friends or when you know each other well become a lot easier to do and ensuring that you can build that comfort with like another person i think is really crucial in doing well in debating but, but more than anything i think you know debate is a very nice community ensuring that you uh, have people in that community that you can have fun with and can trust i think is more important but if you just want to improve, I think being friends is good for improvement too. Uh, so that's all for this one. I hope it's helpful. And I hope that um, I guess whatever experiences I've personally had with my teammates can be translatable for other teams as well.